This week's episode of the And She Looked Up podcast is brought to you by Fine Lime Illustrations. If you love quirky, colorful art transformed into fun, handmade stationery items, pretty much guaranteed to brighten somebody's day, that's just what you'll find in my new online shop at finelimeillustrations.com. That's fine, as in I'm fine, lime as in the fruit, illustrations.com. Browse the entire collection or sign up for my email list to see some behind the scenes peeks into my studio. You'll also get first notice of new product launches and subscriber only sales. And as an added little bonus, you'll also receive a free coloring sheet to help you relax and de-stress from your day. And now on with the show. Welcome to the And She Looked Up podcast. Each week, we sit down with inspiring Canadian women who create for a living. We talk about their creative journeys and their best business tips, as well as the creative and business mindset issues all creative entrepreneurs struggle with. I'm your host, Melissa Hartfield, and after leaving a 20-year career in corporate retail, I've been happily self-employed for 12 years. I'm a graphic designer, an illustrator, and a multi-six-figure-a-year entrepreneur in the digital content space. This podcast is for the artists, the makers, and the creatives who want to find a way to make a living doing what they love. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the And She Looked Up podcast. As always, I am your host, Melissa, and today I am very excited because I am welcoming former Olympian and Canadian independent filmmaker, Phyllis Ellis, to the podcast. Welcome, Phyllis. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm really excited for our conversation today. We're going to be talking about... Um, some big themes, I think. But for those of you who may not be familiar with Phyllis, I'm sure you're probably familiar with at least one of her films. So let's get to know her a little bit better. She is a Canadian independent filmmaker and former Olympian who has worked all over the globe for the past 35 years as a filmmaker, writer, actor, and producer dedicated to telling stories, empowering women's voices around the world. And her work addresses themes of justice, truth, transformation, and human rights. Many of you may be familiar with her feature documentary, Toxic Beauty, which has been viewed by over 44 million people worldwide and was nominated for the 2021 International Emmys and winner of Best Direction and Best Writing at the Canadian Screen Awards. She has also done the film About Her, which won the prestigious Donald Bertain Award at the Canadian Screen Awards for Best Social Political Documentary Film and the film Girls' Night Out, which was nominated for Best Direction. Phyllis has won six Canadian Screen Awards and has been nominated for Best Direction for her work in documentary, film, series, writing, and performance. And she is very proud to present her most recent and meaningful film today, Category Woman, which we're going to be discussing a little bit later. So lots there. <laughs> You've been a busy woman. Um, <laughs> well, when you live a long enough life, you have a long, lo long enough resume, I think. Very yeah. true. <laughs> so the first question I ask everyone who comes on the show is, did you feel like you were creative as a kid growing up? Yes. Yeah, I did, actually. I, um, you know, I had this sort of, um, you know, two worlds. So I was an athlete from a very young age and I was um, you know, expressed myself creatively from a young age. And, um, you know, people always say it's such a strange transition, you know, Olympic athlete to filmmaker or performer, but it, it's actually the dynamic is very similar. You know, you do something, you, you know, you present it, it's on a stage of some sort, whether it's, you know, local or community or school or whether it's international stage. And, um, and there's sort of a beginning, middle and end and you win something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sort of has that kind of trajectory um or you don't in something but that, i mean that's and then that and neither is is sort of i mean i think sport is more you know win win focused because that's the whole point but um yeah i mean when i was you know five i was lead in the school play and i you know and i wrote and i wrote poetry and i um you know had always thought i would 
you know, probably pursue acting. But at the same time, I knew from when I was five or six years old that I wanted to compete in the Olympics. So I just kind of kept saying that. And then did you do the, did you to do the two growing? I mean, you said you you acted in school plays and things like yeah. that. But were you were you doing the two in tandem? Because yeah. you don't just become a professional athlete or a, a high level athlete overnight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I yeah, both. So I was I was um, very involved in sports, all sports. And I just hadn't, you know, like hooked into the one that was going to get me to where I wanted to go, which was the Olympics. And, you know, as fate kind of had it, field hockey presented itself. And uh, and they said, do you want to go to, you know, Berlin? And I thought, yeah. And and then I thought, oh, here's the here's the one. <laughs> um, and at the same time, you know, I was I was in the band at school and I did all the school plays and um, did a lot of writing, creative writing. And had sort of, you know, come at a crossroads when I was going to university. It was kind of York for fine art, you know, theater or U of T for phys ed and, you know, kinesiology. So I, you know, I picked U of T for many reasons and um, but always knew that I would come back to the arts after I had sort of finished my athletic career. Because, you you know, when you're training eight hours a day, there's not a lot of room for. No. Anything else. <laughs> And I think if you're not an athlete, you probably don't think this way, but most most athletes have a relatively short career. I mean, as, especially competing at a, a high level, you're not doing that into your 50s and 60s, right? So no, um, there has no. to be something on the other side of it. And I'm always fascinated by what athletes choose to do after mm -hmm. they retire from, from sport. Yeah. So, so how that did you a natural transition i guess <laughs> how did you how did you make that transition because filmmaking there's there's a very technical aspect to that i would think yeah i mean i think it was a sort of a long evolution because i think when i um when i quit sport um i went back to school um i moved to the states and went back to school uh in a, a theater program and uh, then started working as an actor and um, in, in theater, because I thought that's really wh where my focus was going to be, classical theater. Um, and then, you know, you meet people and then I moved, I moved to another city in the States and, um, you know, had a, had a theater company there, did some work, uh, you know, a, as an actor and, uh, and then moved back to Canada. And, um, you know, thinking of opening my own theater company in Toronto, I mean, there were 700 theaters um at that time i'm sure there's still 700 there are all kinds of small theaters so that wasn't really in the cards and um i sort of transitioned for you know sort of a bunch of fate reasons uh behind the camera and then that's how i started working as a director and i ended up really liking it i liked um the sort of the creation aspect of it and then moved into documentaries i did some comedy stuff and then moved into documentaries and that's really what i've been doing for the last 15 years why documentaries um why why these stories over creating fiction, fiction? yeah um i i really uh was became quite uh mesmerized by um like the real human experience and the storytelling um, uh, of real people in real time and, and, and their, um, the, the importance or the impact that those kinds of stories can have, you know, it's a bit grandiose to change the world, but certainly to change ideas or perceptions mm -hmm. or even perceptions um, and sort of to offer those stories uh in a in a in a unique way you know and and also too when you have a certain level of success with one particular film and then you get another film and then you know you find yourself in a space and i think i do think we gravitate to what we're uh, you know, if it's good at but what you know what you know creatively what we're what people are responding to and what we're mm -hmm. responding to as human beings yeah i know i think there's there's a lot in that how do you know that a, a particular story needs to be told? And how do you know that 
that you're the one to get it out there? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, sometimes things come to you. Um, and sometimes, you know, you run, you know, you fall onto something and then you follow it a little bit and then, and then it's almost like, you know, that sort of old adage, um, you know, if you don't know, you don't know what you don't know, but when you do know, you have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So my way of doing something about something is through filmmaking, because that's my, like, that's my vehicle for expression of expression and it doesn't you know it doesn't always work but I think that um I, I've said this a couple of times but you know you start something and then the film starts to talk back to you and then it's you know it's kind of oh okay and then sometimes you're so far in you can't get out <laughs> like, oh okay I guess I guess this is what I'm doing now so yeah so it's 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 it, and I, I I the second part of the question about how do you know you're the one you know, I I don't think like we're ever the one, but we're the one right now. Right. You know, and and I I think that um, there's a lot of conversation around the telling of your own stories and not appropriating, uh, and those are really valid conversations and really important ones that we need to ask ourselves and ask others. But sometimes, um, you you know, there are many ways that one can kind of come into a story and so while um i you know i'm not um a, a black or brown athlete from a, a a tribal village in in you know the poorest tribal village in south africa um uh, we meet i meet them we meet each other as athletes and then there's this there is a common ground not necessarily in lived experience, because my experience as an athlete from the global north is extremely different than mm -hmm. challenges and, and uh, racial discrimination and gender discrimination of the global south. But we do have this sort of common ground that we understand each other by nature of not not fundamentally what sport means to us, but what it what it is and and the sort of representation of your country and sort of the pride that's associated, not necessarily the outcome, but mm -hmm. um, certainly there's this like, it's, it, it, it's like, um, you know, if you met someone that spoke a different language, but you had, you were the, you had the same vocation and yeah. you could kind of communicate through, you know, pottery or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so there is a, there was a common ground. So I, I think, it's it's not necessarily that you're the best person to tell the story, but you're the person that it's in front of in the right. in that moment in time. Does it ever weigh on you that you're like the responsibility of telling another person's story or helping them tell it? That's why I have PTSD. Like, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. it, it's uh, it's it's all fine. You really feel it when you're with someone that's six days from passing away oh, and gosh. and that you are sucking up two days of their four their six days left you yeah. know i mean but yet they ask you to come because they want this part of their story told and they and they want it to be etched in somewhere forever yeah. that is you know it has impact um but i'm not it's not lost on the fact that I really want to talk to this person and that that would be, you know, so that therein lies sort of the conflict um, of, of a documentary filmmaker that's working in really, you know, with tough subject matter. And I've really heard it likened to um, like a photojournalist that's in Vietnam and a bomb hits and they look down and there's a mom and she's injured and the father's dead and the two kids are crying. Do you get the shot or do you help the people? Yeah. Right. And, 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 you know, and you get the shot and you help the people, but then you win a, a an award for the photograph. And then there's this weird guilt that's associated with that, that prize, because it's, it's, it's born out of such uh, tragedy. And yet, if you didn't have that photograph, then the rest of the world wouldn't know exactly about that tragedy in that moment. So it is quite a bit of conflict around, um, responsibility and it's also um you know how do you create you know people talk about boundaries all the time and how do you create distance 
as a filmmaker, when you know you're visiting an athlete that's living in a tin hut where her 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 safety's violated, you know, minute to minute, and then you say, okay, well, uh, nice nice talking to you today. I'll call times tomorrow at nine, yeah. and you know you're leaving her in the tin hut with no running water, no electricity, and and it's unsafe. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of um, a lot of things to consider. And the other thing too, which it's a really great question. So let's say I'm shooting a woman who has six, you know, six or she's got a week to live ish. And then you're editing her for a whole year. She's already passed away and she's alive in your, like, you know, she's passed away. I'm not pretend. I don't say you pretend yeah. she's, but you're, you're cutting her as, as she is alive because she's, she's alive in the scene in the film because in the film she hasn't died yet yeah it, like it, it's so um it's a complicated reality um and one that we all navigate as, as doc filmmakers all the time yeah it must be i never thought of it from the emotional drain the way i mean you mentioned ptsd and i i laughed but honestly you know i i, I mentioned to you before we started that i watched category woman yesterday and i cried several times through it and I was watching it in a condensed one hour and 15 minutes, I think it was. Um, you lived it for the entire time of filming. And you don't think of that when you're viewing the film. as no. the Or that it takes four and a half years and that you're making decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, how you hear a lot, you know, filmmakers, they want creative control and they want to control their narrative and they want to make the film they want to make and everything. But, you know, you're also dealing with someone's real life. Yeah. And I remember that, especially with category, um, there was this one a moment uh, when we were with Annette uh, on the stairs in Berlin and she had just escaped Uganda and uh, she was sitting on the stairs and, um, she told us a, a bit of her a bit of her story, and then she started to cry, and it was really, like, really difficult for the crew. It was really difficult for her. It was a difficult moment for me. I had just met her, you know, and and we waited, you know, and I remember when we were in the edit for for impact or for to make that scene extra extra. I would have um, chosen to have her to, to say what she said and then actually sit with her while she cried. But, you know, you make these choices and it, it was too intimate. It was too personal. It was too, it was just a moment with us that did not need to be, right. you know, in the film. And so we make those sort of decisions, not only because it's the right decision to make, but also to protect what, you know, it is, it's, it's, you're not, you know, protecting their privacy because they're telling you their story, but there are things that are said that would make the film better or that would, you know, <laughs> but, but that you, you, you know, you choose not to include because from the, you know, the hour and a half of film, you know, you have sometimes 50, 60 hours of footage yeah. that you're, you know, kind of trying to find the best way, especially with category, because it's a complicated story to try and find the best way, the fastest way between two points so that the audience really can kind of follow the the, co the complication as Jim Bunting says, I think in the film, you know, it's complicated in the science and simple in the humanity. And yeah. I think that that's what well, I'm attracted to that sort of, um, you know, tipping point kind of controversial subject matter that maybe you can um, not change excuse me, change someone's mind, but introduce humanity in a new way. Yeah, let's talk about the film specifically, the your most recent one, um, Category Woman, and just maybe for the audience, tell them, give them the brief synopsis of what it's about, and then we can dive in a little bit deeper. Okay. Um, well, it's about um, international sport, um, athletes' rights, uh, women's rights, and human rights violations. Uh, in in international sport and focusing on four women, um, predominantly uh, from the global south. Well, they are from the global south, but four four women whose lives uh, are dramatically altered by um, 
gender discriminating regulations by what was called the International Athletic Amateur, um, <laughs> it's a world, world Athletics that they rebranded for many reasons. And, um, and uh, ha not, um, yes, of course, you know, are these regulations fair and just? No. Are they, you know, do they um, discriminate against women athletes unnecessarily 100%? Um, but n not only that, but it's the, hu the human life impact, the impact of this idea that in some way this is leveling the playing field or uh, creating, um, you know, fair play. Um, and what is fair play if it isn't, you know, bodily autonomy and and inclusion and um safe you know creating a safe place you know for women to compete or athletes to compete in sport and you know the sort of i think uh, zine mungabi who's a um a, a sociologist sort of specializing in race and gender she's originally from south africa you know she says some bodies are marked at the beginning of the film you know, m men go unmarked, women are marked in all the ways they are different. Black and brown women are marked in a particular kind of way. They're marked yeah. as insufficiently human. How do you castigate an entire as insufficiently human by throwing their gender into doubt? And I think that that sort of um, encapsulates the, the premise of the film and, the, and sort of the, how those, all those themes play out with each of the individual stories. Yeah, and you focus on on four athletes in particular, three of whom were from the African continent, I yeah. think, and then one who was from India. Yeah. Um, and you had the fifth girl, Evangeline. Caster, yeah, Caster, Caster Semenya. Yeah, and, and then you had the really young girl at the end who, um, Evangeline, yeah. as a non-athlete and some certainly somebody who never competed at that level, I had no idea the kind of scrutiny that female athletes and their bodies were even under um beyond you know i think everybody's fairly familiar that athletes undergo drug testing but um the rest of it no idea so that was shocking to me and i can't even fathom having my private medical information broadcast to the world um, at 18 years of age that's just it these were girls they weren't even women most of them like you know when all you're, of them yeah they're they're so young and some of them didn't even understand what was happening to them and them. and I just can't even fathom how they deal with that on a daily basis and and um you mentioned Annette crying. She was the one that really broke my heart just mm -hmm. watching her. She just, yeah. Um, what was it that made you bring this particular story to the screen? Like, Well, I, you know, I'd, I'd had sort of an abrupt e exit uh, to sport. I always say I didn't retire, I quit. Um, <laughs> my, my, my personal story is not, not important in this moment, but I had left sport and I always thought, you know, I would eventually come back uh, potentially, maybe I do something, you know, in film. I wasn't sure. Um, and then um, I had followed uh, Castor Semenya's uh, story and what had happened to her in 09. Uh, and then, you know, was equally as, uh, you know, profoundly impacted by what had happened, um, you know, throughout, throughout, uh, her her career and and then what was happening to other athletes and uh, Dr. Bruce Kidd who's at the University of Toronto and an old friend of mine um, had been um, influential in sort of putting together the first team of um, advocates and lawyers to help support Diti Chand at CAS which is the Court of Arbitration of Sport in Lausanne the highest court it's not even a court they're kind of arbitrators but they call it a court um, for athletes to go if they have a problem and if they have a, a dispute that they can't reconcile uh, within their own sport organization, there's an, uh, they call it like ideally a neutral place for them to arbitrate a conflict. And um, so Bruce introduced me to Dr. Mitra, who's the uh, activist in the film mm -hmm. and continues to, uh, uh, you know, advocate for um, the thousands of athletes that are impacted by 
World Athletics a couple of weeks ago came out with new regulations, taking everyone, all of them off the field. So even Christine, um, uh, who came, who had won a silver medal uh, in um, at the last Olympics, she's taken off the track. All of the athletes that are even touched by these regulations uh, and, and younger athletes, um, it's really devastating. So um, there's this really uh, uh, outstanding athlete named Francine Niasaba, and she is not in the film, but she was a silver medalist in the 800 in 16 in Rio. And uh, one of the stipulations was, well, if you test high for testosterone, natural, naturally high testosterone, not, not anabolic or right. anything yes. for doping, um, you, um, you can't run the four, the eight, the mile. I think it was the four, the eight, the mile. And so you can either take drugs, have an operation or um, switch events. So that's what Christine did at the Olympics. She switched from the four to the two and won a silver in the two. But um, so for what Francine did was she switched from the 800 to the 3000. That's kind of unheard of. It's really hard. It's like saying to, almost like saying to, you know, a soccer player, well, you can't play soccer anymore. Go play hockey. You know, like it's it's that different. Like they're completely different sports. So, but, but Francine was successful and she switched events and had enormous success in the last couple of years at the three and um and with the new regulations they just put out a couple of weeks ago it wipes her off so not only did she conform and say okay fine i'm not going to take drugs because i'm not sick and i don't need to take medication i'm actually going to do what you say ask i'm going to switch events because for some reason you think these events are a problem and uh, i'm going to switch events and then i'm going to win and even at that win then and then they they've just since taken her off the track so there's I, I imagine shortly, in short order, there'll be some response from the athletes. I don't know what, but um, like this is an ongoing issue. I, I spoke in South Africa uh, around on International Women's Day, actually, to a group of athletes. And they were talking about, you know, because it's not just track, right? It's like no, the, yeah. the, the captain of the football team, so, women's soccer team, she just got called out and um, and identified and tested and and it you know i mean when you, originally when you said you know i don't think what people realize is that sex testing has been around since the you know 1930s and we were all sex tested so right through you know in various ways from then right through officially on the books until i believe um the olympics were still testing right through the 2000s um, a lot of sports stopped officially testing, but what they used was um, your dope testing. Because when you're doped, you're, you're you know nipples down naked, and you're using the washroom. Like people think, what you, like what we go into a private room with a little cup and we pee in a cup, like you go to the doctor. That's not what it's like. And so you're literally somebody is staring at your body, two feet two feet from your body, while you're trying to, you know, urinate in a cup to prove that you're not doping. Um, and they're looking at your anatomy and they're looking at your body and making a call on whether or not they like what they see or that it looks, uh, quote unquote, normal to them. So they might look at me and go, geez, I don't know, something's. And then they whisper out me to somebody and say, you know, I just doped Phyllis and I don't know if something's not quite right. And then um and then I'm in for a blood test, and then I'm in for a battery test, and then I'm taken off the track, or I'm flying home from a world championships, and when I land, it's all over the news that um, I'm a man. And in, in that, that the insult of that, as Castor says in the film, it, it it's like, um, like I think Greg Knott, uh, Castor's lawyer, says it too. You know, it's it's who you are and someone is telling you that you are not who you are. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's so much conversation around um, a lot of different conversations in sport right now, but um, in this particular film, these are women, born women, compete as women and um, their higher, naturally higher level of testosterone is called the performance advantage is no different than, Michael Phelps wingspan or his size 
48 feet or an, a basketball player that's six foot seven, all athletes have anomalies. That's why we're Olympians because we all They're have humans. Some... We're humans, right? We are all we're different. Human. We're all different, <laughs> but but athletes because they have ex something extra. Yeah. Extra fast twitch fiber. I have a really, you know, uh, abnormally um, efficient maximum volume of oxygen. So I could smoke three packs of cigarettes and run a marathon. Like I just, my, my, my oxygen uptake is really, and I can also run really fast. So I have fast twitch and uh, slow twitch, which, and, and um, so I'm a u unique person. I mean, I don't, I, I don't run at all anymore, but when I was an athlete, you know, mm -hmm. So, but, but there's fear associated and there's racism attached to this as, you know, we show in the film and, and it, uh, and men know, don't go through this at all. Do they? No, there hasn't been ever a man that's been sexist. And just so the audience knows from 1968, I think was the, like on the books official from 1968, 66, 67, they were nude parading. Women were walking in front of doctors naked and they were looking at your breasts and your body and saying, yeah, no too flat a chest, voice is too low or whatever, you know, decision they were making about who is a woman and who isn't. And then from 66, 68 till 2000, you know, all women in all sports, winter and summer Olympics were sex tested. Um, and, and I mean, like, well, they had different names for it. Fem test, gen gender test, mm. sex test. And then you got a little card, you got a lanyard that said, I'm a woman. Mm. You showed that in the film. Here's your certificate. <laughs> you pass. <Go> woman. <laughs> you pass. But then you could fail the next time they test yeah, you. Yeah, and you get it taken away. That's, yeah. that's um, yeah. So, so if, you know, what, what was it that struck you about these particular women that you brought into the film, the four that you, you decided to work with on this? Well, it, you know, it, it works both ways. So it's, it's, you deciding, but it's also who decides to speak to you. Right. Yeah. So these, these four women were ready mm -hmm. to share their stories. It takes a lot of courage, you know, to, Absolutely. to share your story publicly. Um, and uh, so these were the four women that, um, that agreed. Yeah, that agreed and invited me to, um, you know, into their lives and into their stories. And, you know, I mean, it's funny, like there's a lot going down right now. And I thought maybe I should open the film up and have like category woman 2.0 or <laughs> three, and then, you know, tell all the, the, you know, what's going on, if, you know, as we speak. Yeah, it is really interesting because obviously the film was released earlier this year, but you've been working on this for, for several years, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and now this year, you know, we're hearing so much in the news with and I'm not up on global athletics, but just even here in Canada, we're seeing things with like the Canadian women's, women's soccer team and pay yeah. equity and um, things like that. And we're seeing things with Hockey Canada and how women are exactly. treated by male athletes. And I, after, do, after, after doing the film and then seeing everything that's happening, do you feel like change is positive change is coming and because you just mentioned that you know all these women a couple of weeks ago were removed from yeah <laughs> I mean you know it, it's all just like sort of a big huge thing because the strides that have been made in women's sport are enormous you know even from when I was a kid the, you know the number of you know the, the opportunities and yeah. a lot of four sisters have fought long and hard to you know create the space for women to compete our women identified athletes to compete. So um, change, like it's hard. And I, I, I'm i not sure at the sort of international level of sport until they have diverse and diverse women um, as decision makers uh, at the top of those organizations. Yeah. You know, if you continually have a group of, you know, white guys at the top of the food chain, it's the food chain is going to remain the same. And so, especially when it crosses, I always describe because people don't understand how it kind of works. And I always say, well, sports like the, like the Vatican. So there's the Pope of sport and that's the president of the IOC and that's the Vatican. 
Right. Then all of the sports are like the archdiocese. So there's the archdiocese of swimming and the archdiocese of soccer and and field hockey and track and field and world athletics or whatever. And they they have their own like silo and there is complete autonomy in that silo. They're like their own business. And so they call it the autonomy of sport. So the Olympics, the Pope doesn't want anybody giving him guff. Same with the IOC. Like they're they're uh, void of international law. Like they they're their own island. And then but the Pope has to interfere or get involved when something really big happens. It's like, oh man, I gotta go and you know, I gotta make a comment about <clears throat> so while the IOC doesn't want to be on the wrong side of history with inclusion and um fairness and bodily autonomy and safe sport for <clears throat> all athletes, let's say. And they don't want to be uh, in any way in the space of human rights violations. So what they do is they say, totally, hear you. They're, um, the advocates, athletes, and lawyers and whatever really fought for this thing. And the IOC came up with a new framework saying, okay, we're not going to sex test anymore. We believe you. Compete as you say. Identify yourself. And we're good. However, what we're going to let the archdiocese do is they're going to make their own decisions. So within that silo of world of FIFA or, or world athletics or FINA, they make their own call based on <clears throat> inclusion or regulations. And within their within their auto the autonomy of their organization, um, they're we they're weeding out the whomever they want to weed out before they get to the Olympic Games. Right. So the IOC kind of knows, okay, you know what? We're we'll just we'll just be all inclusive because we don't want to be the bad guy. They're gonna they're gonna take care of all of this for us anyway. Exactly. By the time the, their team gets to the Olympics, we're gonna be clear. It's 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 gonna be all good. But where the problem happens is um, when athletes within that archdiocese say we don't care that you're uh, you know the the boss of me because you're not the boss of me. And what's different now, even than ten years ago, twenty years ago, is that athletes now. Um, no is a sentence now and ath athletes with the me too movement and everything else that's gone on in other sectors um, athletes voices matter and um, and you know you, you find this sort of allyship and more solidarity you also find you know <laughs> a, a, you know a percentage of athletes that don't really agree that inclusion is important but um, I think um, I don't. I don't think change will come soon. Yeah, that was. Yeah. I how think I the felt at the end of the film. <laughs> but I think the conversation is happening. I think it would take it would take an army of um, important athletes that's that that walked away from money and fame and power for a moment and said, we're, we're going to, we're not, we're going to stand here until it changes. Yeah. I think then, then you would see change, but it's so hard to be that person because, mm -hmm. you know, you can be right, but you can be dead. Right. And, uh, and, and when your livelihood depends on it and, you know, you've created a brand or you, you know, you're, you know, an import, you, you have this life. It's really hard at what point do you sort of sacrifice that, for the good, for the greater good, you know, yeah. it's easy for me to say, you know, I'm 60, whatever years old, 63 years old. And, you know, I can say I can do anything I want because of my, you know, I'm not worried about whether or not I'm going to get cut from the team. Yeah. But when I was an athlete, there were so many times I wanted to, you know, step up and I, and you, and you know, there's, there's, you know, you're 18, 19 years old and, you know, you don't maybe you don't do the right thing in that moment because you're so young. That's why, like, I look at these women and and I think, man, at eighteen or nineteen, I don't think I would have had um, the courage to do like to step forward and do what they did. That came through really clearly in the film. That on the one hand, these girls were so young, and in many cases, very naive about what they were getting into, and yet on the other hand, they were so grown up. <laughs> You know, they, they, okay. yeah. And, and they had 
lived and seen far more than people much older than them and had experienced some pretty yeah you know, for, for sure and i think too it's also lived experience like mm -hmm. their lives are tough at the, at the fundamental level yeah. right yeah you uh, can't compare their lives to growing up in canada and being an athlete here it's just not comparable <laughs> not even not not even at all so you know as dr kid says you know if you want to level the playing field then forget about all this other stuff but put all the athletes in one place mm. for two years give them the same nutrition the same money the same coaching the same equipment the same environment the same altitude the same everything that would be very interesting for our games and then send everybody yeah. to the games then you'd you'd have a level playing field but yeah. you know without that you know when one athlete is what you know is going to win the gold medal and send her brothers to school and build a new house for her mom and fill, feed her community and another athlete is going to go buy a pair of, you know, fancy, you know, whatever it, it, and, you know, and competing for your country, like the fundamental reality of that is, is very, also very different when you come from uh, really tough, yeah. tough circumstances, you know, when you're going to get killed if you're othered or if you're and from the LBGTQI yeah. community and you could go to jail or be killed. Um, it's a little bit different than you know fighting for rights absolutely know, <laughs> absolutely you not that not that um you know not that people from the lbgtqi community aren't murdered in north america they are and and it, it's it's a it's it's horrible yeah. um it's horrible but there there is a level of support here and and voices louder yes. voices here yeah. than you, know, you can't even have a voice in say a country like uganda yeah yeah Yes. So <laughs> oh, there's a lot of heavy themes in in the film. Um, and I found it interesting because your previous films or or most of your previous films also really focus on women and women's bodies and how they're marketed to or how they're treated or how they're exploited. And mm. so that is, that definitely seems to be a common theme in the subjects that you choose to mm. to to work on. Um, what? Can you tell us a little bit about what you've got in mind for your next project? Or is that too early to talk about? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I think um, uh, one of the projects that I'm looking at uh, is, a you know, extremely historic, um, very big, important um, film that I, I can't talk about in this moment, but um, safe to say it's likely in the sport world. And um, I uh, I have another film in development with CBC, although if I don't deliver the trailer, I'm gonna probably never get it made. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's tentatively titled Beautiful, uh, but it's the precursor and then pushes through onto the other side of Toxic Beauty, which was what we're using and this film is looking at why we're using, why we're using the products. What, 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 you know, how, how is beauty defined across the board? And, um, and, you know, what, what are those now like very real? They're not even external uh, influences. They're, you know, daily sort of influences on our, on our psyche and, and, uh, and young humans that are being, um, it, it, the damage, the damage that it's being done, that's it being done, and and kind of a little, a little bit of funny in the fact that you know, you know, nothing works. Like there's no anti-aging cream that does it makes any difference at all, and I find that part of it all kind of funny, um, you know, and fasting and water and you know all this stuff that we do, you know, just to 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 buy. I don't know. Aquafina or whatever that you know, you're telling us we have to drink 72 bottles of water. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause they want us to purchase more water. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I, so, so th those, uh, you know, are two things that I'm, I'm looking at and, uh, but you know, you come to a point too, where I, 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 I can't spend four and a half years on a film. Um, one, I'm not sure I'll be alive long enough, but two, um, it's, it's, uh, it's it's gut wrenching and and it, it it's a very difficult and it's it's 
it doesn't monetize well the longer you spend on something right so while sometimes it just takes that kind of time and COVID was in the middle of this one so mm. it was a, an interruption that we all had to deal with yeah yeah um, do you take yeah. time after each project to just decompress from it or process it like do you have that or do you jump right into the next thing well that you know that's the the life of a I don't know if it's just a Canadian filmmaker, but as a documentary filmmaker, it's not like, you know, I, you know, I've got a, a ski chalet in Gestalt <laughs> other than skiing out of. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we all find ourselves in a position where we have to kind of be in development, be in production and, and be in post-production. Um, while I was finishing Toxic, I, I mean, um, yeah, while I was finished toxic, I was toxic. I was shooting category, and while I was cutting category woman, I was writing a very large um, international feature doc uh, for another company. Um, so we, you know, I'm sure I have ADD, ADHD, although it's quite useful, you know, um, and or not. Like maybe it's an asset and a liability, probably. But I think we're always. Uh, working on a couple of things because, um, you know, and that's my commitment to myself. If if I make another film, um, I it, I just don't want it to take three years of my life. Right. Now, sometimes it does because it takes a while to follow something. But I think that the, the – because you, you, you don't want to be behind the story. You want to be a little ahead of the story, but you don't want to be too far ahead of the story that when the film comes out, people are like, what? And, and, and yet you don't want to be, you want to be a little bit ahead so that it's, it's like this new information. So, and it, and you, it's so hard to know. Yeah. Um, like toxic. We, I think we were, we had a really nice moment at hot dogs and then it was like almost a year before it had any other, you know, before it had it, the life and the life got regenerated with the broadcast. I think it was February in February of 20. So like, that's a long time to like festival and not know, and you know, it doesn't sell. And, and then, and then I remember when a, fr a friend of mine sent me an email and said, congratulations. I'm like, like for what? And they're like, you're nominated for an Emmy. And I'm like, for what? Like, because <laughs> I didn't, I did no concept that cat, that toxic was still, you know, having a, a moment. And um, so it's just funny, the cycle of, fil of films, um, you know, sometimes it takes two or three years to get it, you know, kind of has its moment. And sometimes it happens really fast. Like it, yeah. it just, it just depends on the subject matter, I think. Do you find that just before we wrap up, just in terms of being a filmmaker, um, you know, do you face challenges as a female filmmaker? I feel like you must because it feels like female, whatever you are, there's a, there's always a challenge. But um, what what have been like, what are some of the biggest challenges as a filmmaker? I've never had a filmmaker on the podcast. So this is my first chance to kind of ask these questions. As a woman filmmaker or as it just as a both, filmmaker? Both, both. Well, mm -hmm. um, you're always dependent on somebody making a decision whether or not, you, you know, what you have is good enough. Right. So, um, you know, unless you're independently wealthy or you have private funding, you're dependent on, you know, a broadcaster or a distributor or, or an executive producer putting you into development. So your concept is, is constantly and your ideas are constantly being judged. You know, it made me laugh I, and I won't name names, but I had this idea uh, and it was called um, Love, uh, Love in the Time of Now. And I really wanted to not do a gut wrenching, eye popping, stab your heart out, drag myself through women passing away while I'm shooting them show. And it was all just about love. And I had found all these love stories from around the world. And it was just really simple and, and, and big love, little love. Like what I mean is, you know, crossing borders, you know, saving lives, love and growing vegetables for your community, love, you know, and in, 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 in different countries. And it was just, everybody was like, Oh man, you know, love. Uh, blah, blah. And um, there's a, there's a, there's a doc on, on um, Netflix right now. That is exactly, it's like someone 
took my idea and just like grabbed it or someone heard and told someone yeah. who told someone. And so like in that moment, whoever I was talking to about it was like, man, they didn't care. And it wasn't something that grabbed them or that they wanted in that moment. And then a year and a half later, had I pitched it at a different time, like coming out of COVID when nobody wanted to have eye stabbing stories anymore. People wanted just a little bit of a break and maybe have a laugh um, that, that, that film gets, you know? So I think you're always dependent on other people yeah. um, to, to not only to um, uh, uh, green light, but also to have an opinion. So, you, you know, you always like, there's these other people now, notes are great and other people's eyes on your work makes your work better I don't mean that but it's like a lot of opinions um I've had 70 notes on a cut and I've had two words make it smarter so it's like you know you just never know quite what you're going to get and as you get older um like I'm far less defensive about um notes I just say sure thanks and I walk away thinking there's no way I'm doing that. <laughs> or, or on the other hand, somebody that, you know, you don't really get on with all that well comes into an edit and says, um, I think you should switch act two for act three. You're like, yeah, no. And then the editor says, oh, I'm not doing that. That's so stupid. Then I lay in bed at night and I think, you know, so I'm doing it in my mind. And then I go in the edit the next day. I say, okay, switch act two for act three. And the editor's like, what? No way. And then we do it and we watch it and we're like, yeah, that was a really good note. You know, it made the yeah. film better, but, but it is being dependent on other people. I think that's really hard. I think it's also um, really a challenge to um, move on from a project because people get really attached to you because um, sometimes it, they've never told that story before. Oh, from the or participant they, or, side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, or, they, or they um, just want to, they, they haven't finished talking. Yeah. I remember a young woman that was um, really close to, to passing away and she called me from the hospital and she said, you have to come, like you, you have to come tonight. I, I'm not finished. I, I, I haven't oh, finished gosh. what I want to say. You, ha you have to bring a camera and you have to come. And she was in ICU. I had a cold. I would have gone really if I didn't have a cold. I would have gone, but I wouldn't have been allowed in the room. Right. You know. So there's this attachment that is really, really hard to. And not that you want to break it, but you know, <clears throat> you know, you're you're talking on the phone about something else, and then you know somebody's sending you a note saying, you know, I'm really struggling. Can I, you know, or someone's children, like. You know, the, the, the subject in the film passes away and their children want to keep in touch with you because you've got footage of their mom, you know. Yeah. It's, it's just, it, it's a little bit. And I think that over time I'm getting better at kind of um, managing it. But I would say um, that I'm not the best at it. Um, and, and I think, and I also think, you know, like if you look at, uh, you know, the DGC, you know, and, and what doc filmmakers get paid for all the work that we do, and it's not the DGC's fault. It's just that with a category that we're in based on what the networks allow sort of filmmakers to make. Right. Like we're after four years, like, you know, at X number of dollars sounds really good if that's what you make for a year. But you spread that out, out after four and a half years, you're making a dollar an hour and you're working 24-7. It's it's so there's a there's a tough sort of monetizing space, you know. I know a lot of doc filmmakers that are you know, they 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 have second jobs. They teach. They're therapists. They, you know, they they do they top up. Yeah. You know, yeah, a lot a lot of interesting uh, that they'd be therapists. Yeah, but that makes that makes sense really when you think. About yeah, it. yeah. The listening, you know, the listening. Absolutely. And, because I think the other thing that's really hard, and I think it's something that certainly the documentary world is becoming more attuned to is that we are not therapists. And sometimes people are, are sharing their like most traumatic or most intimate or, you know, horrible, you know, whatever it is that they're sharing with us. And then we're like, Hey, okay, thanks. You know? And, and so who holds them after they've just relived, you know, re-traumatized. Mm-hmm. 
And then also there's the crew that's been traumatized by the story. And so I think the documentary community, certainly internationally, and I know in Canada, they're looking at, you know, what what things can they put in place for doc filmmakers and, and the team of documentary filmmakers, inclusive of the cinematographer and the set and the sound designer and the editors and that are all working in, yeah. you know, in trauma. Yeah, you're immersed in it. Mm -hmm. through the whole project that's why I wanted to do a film called love is the time love in the time and now yeah, absolutely <laughs> <laughs> I was saying someone said what do you want to do and I said oh, I want to do a story about the little old lady uh from across the street you know who steals my mail like it's just you know, something that really is um a little lighter <laughs> gent gentle and a little yes. lighter yeah and you know and the last thing I'll say too is the women in the film are you know, whether they're survivors or warriors or however you want to categorize them, they are champions. And to have experienced what they experienced and to reach that the level of success they have, you know, they really are incredible human beings. Yeah, that comes through very much so in the film. It's you can't help but admire um, them and, and what they've gone through. I, that's that's what I said to a friend after I watched it yesterday. I was like, I couldn't have done what they did at mm -hmm. all like I would have been out before the, before any of it even happened so right. um yeah right. I, I just... that, that, that's the that's the hardcore you know co co competitive um and also they and also too fighting for yourself when you know they're wrong like yeah. you know as duty chance said you know the humiliation of it, the public humiliation, going to restaurants, people wouldn't talk to her. And she got outed at the beginning because somebody said she ran like a boy or, or she, oh, I know one of the comments was um, she walked by herself outside at night. So she must be a guy. And so these, these, the inferences of even athletes saying those things then builds this sort of, seed of doubt builds the case against and, you yeah and it's sort of this yeah because you know what did they say like an accusation is is as um is it can be as damning as uh, or problematic as a as um actually being you know guilty of something you know it's yeah. it's it's sometimes worse because the more you defend the more people are like well yeah but you there know, was what? even a quote about that in the film you know that, that the ones who defend are the most likely the culprits or something along those lines, but it was just like, ah, you can't win. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, I think Stefan and Berman said in a quote, um, something like, you know, they say they're women, even if they scream the loudest from the top of a building or something, it, yeah. it's just so gross. It, it even was... to say that it, it, it just, it, it, it's like not, in, it's not even intelligent. No, it was, it's, it's not even it's not even a thing you know and and uh but yet he carries an, a lot of weight in this conversation and yeah. hopefully hopefully that might change that maybe they won't you know maybe maybe the the maybe the the, the there'll be a power shift and there'll be you know different um new voices at the table yeah i mean nobody can stay in a position forever just that's just how life works. The world so, works. So you, you hope that um, when the opportunity comes for new voices to come in, that some truly new voices will come in. But I guess that's to be seen. Um, yeah, exactly. It's just they have to be invited to the table. And yeah. that's well, the, that's part of it. Yeah. Right. Like Dr. Mitra, you know, she should be at She's every She's amazing. Table. Yes. She was so interesting to listen to. And she um, is amazing. Yeah. Just, Gosh. Well, well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, where can people watch the film, see the film, and where can they find you online? And we will put links to all of this in the show notes. Um, well, easiest probably right now is um, uh, the category woman doc um, website. And then you can see the film on um, TVO. Uh, it's streaming on TVO on the yes, YouTube channel and I think they YouTube. may have they may have a few more broadcasts but I'm not exactly sure um what their what their plan is but I know a lot of people have watched it um on TV which is really great yeah yeah it's uh 
it's on it, it was on youtube yesterday i was able to send the link to a few friends on the oh, tvo okay. on the tvo youtube channel so for those of you who aren't in ontario and would like to watch you can yeah watch it no on it's great <laughs> um but thank you so much for having me it was a great conversation yeah no I, I really appreciate it and um for all of you out there listening if you have the opportunity I really do recommend um checking out the film it will make you angry um but sometimes we need to be angry about things um yeah that's how we will change things exactly <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much, Phyllis. It was great to have you here. And for everyone listening, I will be back soon with another brand new episode. And we will talk to you all then. Thank you so much for joining us for the And She Looked Up Creative Hour. If you're looking for links or resources mentioned in this episode, you can find detailed show notes on our website at andshelookedup.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter for more business tips, profiles of inspiring Canadian creative women, and so much more. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show via your podcast app of choice so you never miss an episode. We always love to hear from you, so we'd love it if you'd leave us a review through iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Drop us a note via our website at anshelookedup.com or come say hi on Instagram at anshelookedup. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.